Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Alex Cosmiter. Um, I'm the new youth coordinator here at Waterwise Cochise County through the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension's Waterwise program. Um, today we'll be, we'll be hearing from my colleague Ar Marianne Capehart. Um, and we're going to be in for a good rainwater talk. Marianne Capehart is the coordinator here at the Waterwise program here in the University of Arizona Co op Extension. Cochise County. Um, she helps the community embrace water wise practices like conserving water indoors, collecting rainwater, using gray watering, xeriscaping, and understanding the state of our watershed. She believes most people want to keep their water supply plentiful and clean and enjoys encouraging and helping them to do just that. She is also an advocate of leaving enough water in our waterways and aquifers for the environment to flourish. Ms. Cape Hart has a master's of env environmental education from the University of Arizona in Tucson and currently lives in Bisbee, Arizona. Um, I hear she also has some performance art experience, but I don't know about that. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll get to hear about that later. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we're very excited to talk about one of our favorite topics, which is rain harvesting. And uh, this will um, deal with different elements of that. Um, so I am going to put up my PowerPoint and uh, get started looking at some images. So tonight I'm gonna deal with three basic Three area, basic areas. One is the basics. Um, not a lot, a lot of technical detail, but I will send you in the right direction for more of that. Um, the second is um, going large, larger scale rain harvesting. And the last one will be um, treating water to potable standards. All right. So this is um, tailored somewhat for a, a Wilcox audience. And there is the Playa, which is the largest interior draining basin in the state. So just a little bit of this Wilcox basin runs out of the basin north, very small amount and an equally small, uh, more or less amount runs out the south. So it's an interesting land formation. Can everybody see? I'm assuming so. Um, little quiz, again, um, which of these sources supply water to Cochise County? So we have precipitation, um, just to get us thinking about water. That's rain, obviously, snow, sleet, hail, fog, et cetera. Uh, or is there storm water supplying um, our needs? That's also called runoff, which is rain that has hit the ground and is moving over the surface of the ground. Storm water hits is rain on the ground. Surface water is lakes, creeks, rivers, and springs. Groundwater is water under the ground in an aquifer. And then effluent is treated wastewater. So which of these supply water to Cochise County? All but see are correct. So we have uh, most of our water comes from groundwater. Um, we have some effluent, a very, very small amount of effluent is, is, is used to provide water for treated wastewater. Um, we don't have any water that we're pulling off of rivers. And um, we do have some stormwater retention basins and people use stormwater on their property. Um, and there's precipitation that falls on the ground. So most of um, our water comes from groundwater, as I said, it's about 82% in the, um, this planning area, southeast planning area of the state. So I think, I think because of this, I think most people understand how, how very important it is to um, protect our groundwater and protect our aquifer. Um, so that's, that's a given. Uh, water, these are all the things that you can use 
uh, rain for. So I just kind of thought, thinking about all the things we use water for in our small acreages or homes. And we could do the basics. So, um, as I said, I'm going to I'm going to cover some of the basics in a very basic way. Um, but here are some publications that you can refer to, uh, written by my predecessor and Cindy Williams, Katie Daly and Cindy Williams. These are all Wilkins. I'm sorry. Um, these are awesome, and um, we'll put the the link in the chat for you. And there's also other places you can look on our website to find out detailed information. And please feel free to contact me at any time. So uh, just to keep your mind active, I'm asking you to please pick up these terms today. So uh, if you don't know them already, so um, we've got four of them. So there's active rain harvesting, passive rain harvesting, dry delivery, this is for active rain harvesting, and wet delivery is for rain, active rain harvesting. So Get those sorted out in your mind. Thank you. So I'm gonna tell you about passive right now. We're not covering this tonight, um, but it is when you capture rain in the ground. So I, I often say like, you know, keep the rain on your side, keep it. Don't let it run off into the street. Um, any indentation is gonna help slow down and sink uh, rain. So it's, it's a wonderful practice. You know, you've got a little, got a little rock river on the left. Uh, this is a big basin up in um, Tucson campus. Um, so even very shallow things can help keep water on the property. There's no reason to let it run into the street if you're living in town and even run into a road out in the country, keep it. Basics, all right. So this is um, a, little, a little very basic diagram here. Um, you have the roof. Is the, is the main way people catch water. It's impermeable, so it just runs right down. It goes into a gutter, which goes into a pipe, which goes into a tank, okay, or also called a cistern. So there's some other features here, which is a first flush diverter. That's when the water goes there first, fills up, and then the cleaner water bypasses. So this is great after a dry season when there's a lot of dust on the roof. Uh, and then you empty it out. And there's other, uh, there's another filter they have here, which um, aren't really being used too much anymore. Um, but it's, it's still, it's still a good diagram, this filter that's on the left. And then in this case, there's a booster pump. And there's some filtration. So this is pretty applicable to both uh, harvesting rain for plants and people. Uh, here is a little feature of this drawing that is missing. So I popped it in. So anytime you have any kind of a water system, you have to plan for an overflow because if it's rains beyond the capacity of your tank, you don't want it just real nilly willy coming over the side of the top of the tank or clogging up your gutters. So there's a big, nice pipe that's gonna go down when it fills up to the very brim. And it will have a mosquito and critter guard on the bottom. Also an important part of rain harvesting is keeping out mosquitoes and critters and keeping the water light tight. Oh, let me see, there's a bigger view of that. Uh, overflow, a very important part of any water system. Here's a, another diagram of the same. This comes from the publication that I'll be mentioning later. Um, so you have the rain, you have the roof, you have the gutter. There's your first flush. This is going underground. Now this going underground is, is called a wet system. So I mentioned in your, vocabulary list, uh, the term wet delivery. So it's wet because when it's full, it, there can be water in the bottom of this pipe. So it goes down and from the force of gravity goes up into the top of the tank. Grant, as long as there is enough space, enough what they call head pressure from where the rain is entering the pipes 
and the top of the tank have to be several feet apart. So the top of the tank has to be several feet lower than where the rain enters the pipe. And then you've got an overflow there on the right and you've got the outflow is going to a booster pump. It's going to some filters. It's going to a UV radiation tube and then to the fixtures. So these are the basics. Keep in mind, if, you, if you're not familiar, you've got a roof or other catchment, you've got gutters, kind of an expensive part of the system, um, piping the tank itself, distributing it out of the tank and filtration and treatment. So of these, the gutters and the tank are, are by far the most expensive items. Um, regarding collection service tanks, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, roofs, this is um, kind of a question for some people if they have a complicated roof. Where are the slopes? Where is the rain going to go? Where to put the gutters? So that's just a, a consideration. And I will talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, I like this shot because um, this is the Bisbee um, Museum bathroom. Um, is be a mining and historical museum. They painted that gutter um, to match the brick. So in the middle there, I thought that was kind of nice. Now this is a dry delivery because it's going straight from the gutter into the tank. So it's not gonna go underground. And so it's, it's, it's dry in the sense that the pipe will be dry after the rain is delivered into the tank after the rainfall. Here is my tank. Um, very humble, still at this point, uh, you know, start small. And so um, instead of doing my house, I decided to do my garage. So this easy install for the gutter, I wanted to get something in as fast as I could. So that's just an easy gutter install comes down, we had to kind of go around the corner into my um, 350 gallon tank, which I use for my garden. And there's kind of a funky overflow there. Um, which is smaller than I would recommend, but I used what I had. It's nice to use up materials that are sitting around and that goes into um, a garden space, a little basin in my garden. Here are the two types of conveyance systems. There you go, wet and dry. One goes underground and comes up by the force of gravity. And that one has an overflow. And there is the dry delivery just comes straight off the roof, which can be Sometimes difficult if, if there's vehicles that might run into there or um, earthquakes or something shuddering, but um, they're both very valid and we, we, we tend to use more dry delivery down here. Some tanks, these are polyethylene tanks, the most common kind of tank used these days. So you can see if you wanna Look at the one on the left that this is, um, you can think about what kind of delivery is this? It's coming underground, it's going up to the top. And these are nice big tanks. Uh, this is a tank in Bisbee. He's a ex-fireman, has some really nice fittings and big pipes. Big pipes are good to keep the water flowing. Um, and so what else can I say about this? Oh, this guy uses his water, um, his rain to drink and his garden. So he, he's, he's piping some of the water up to his um, treatment system on his porch and drinks the rain, prefers it to groundwater and actually prefers it to the city water. So he uses uh, city water for bathing and, and washing dishes and so forth, but he uses the rainwater to drink. And that's a system down up in um, near St. David. Here's a cool tank. That's kind of like the water towers you see on the buildings. New York City, other places. Uh, underground cistern, we'll be talking a little bit more about one of those later. These are modular, so they're relatively inexpensive and they have a big sheet that protects the water. Um, other forms of underground storage. Um, these are quite inexpensive. The guy, a guy used to be selling them outside of, um, Douglas, I haven't seen him for a while, but he was selling for about $75 for like 200 gallons. And that's a good price. You can convert them. They're good to paint, to make them a little more light tight. Uh, horse trough. We have kind of a plan for that on the Waterwise, web, uh, wa yeah, Waterwise website, if you're interested. It's got an overflow. Um, 
small is good too. Um, you know, put it in various places around the home. And I was just telling um, Christy, who's, who's here tonight, that I use mine a lot for my house plants, and I still have some. Uh, my bigger tank is empty. Pray for rain. Here are a bunch of tanks in Cochise County. Uh, the top left is the U of A campus. The, there's some of those IBC totes at a, a, a home in Sierra Vista. Um, the bottom one is Cochise, the campus, uh, Cochise College. And that's a new one. Oh, it's not here. There's a new one at the Bisbee Boys and Girls Club. There's a new one at the Copper Queen Library Annex. And so there's so many, there's so many in the area, it's wonderful. So in terms of, of, of water for, for plants, um, you can use gravity fed irrigation, um, depending on how much water is in tank, because that's gonna give you your pressure. So there, there's various ways to get it out, um, but it will be slow. Um, I, this is, again, I'm not gonna get too technical. I, I just, I'm a, I'm a little bit detailed here about what kind of pressure you can get in a tank. So um, some people do prefer to use um, a pump to pressurize the water to make it easier to use. Yeah, if you elevate the tank, it gives you a little bit more pressure. And if you've got a tank uphill, that's, that's also helpful for more pressure. Okay. Here's some options for tanks, I'm sorry, for pumps. Some are in the tank, some just transfer it to another tank or another location, and some are outside of the tank. This one is a, is a pressure booster tank outside of the tank. Um, this is a beautiful property in Car Canyon that got an um, award for um, an application they made to WaterWise um, quite a while ago to be able to install a system and you can decide if this is a wet or dry delivery. Um, this is um, the, uh, one of the rain tanks of, of Kato Daly. She lives in Bisbee. She did WaterWise for many, many years. She, some of you may know her quite well. Um, demonstrating how clear the water is um, after being stored with not a, not a lot of pre-filtration. So it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, and then there's the, the sort of math of it. And um, these are in the publications that we um, put up earlier. So you, you do get an idea uh, that there's quite a bit of, of water to be had on a, on a surface, depending on its size. Um, you can use 60% of the square feet if you want to do a quick ballpark. So you take the square feet of a roof and just multiply by 60% and that'll be gallons. So um, you can do it a little bit more you know, accurately by saying, I'm gonna do an efficiency factor because some of that rain might get blown out of the gutters. Uh, may, maybe there were some leaves in there and it kind of toppled over the side of gutter. If you wanna be a stickler, you can add a, a coefficient for 90% that will kind of lower your harvest um, for unforeseen difficulties with a, with a perfect harvest. All right, so that's, but again, if you just take the square foot of a roof you might have in mind for harvesting off of and take 60% of that, that gives you roughly the amount of gallons in an inch of rain. And you can use that inch to, to multiply for like all the inches that you expect to get over the year. So it's best to, to calculate for an inch first. Okay. Okay, so the wet, the wet delivery goes through the, across the gutter, down the ground, underneath and up into the tank. And a dry one means it just goes straight from that top of the, of the gutter, straight across into the tank. And everybody got the passive one right, awesome. Take, take four new vocabulary words home if you don't know them already. <laughs> All right. All right, so 
Uh, second part of the talk is um, rainwater for people and uh, I call it going large. Um, the reason that I got interested in this topic is that I read an article um, in the Republic about a man who had run, his well had run dry. And the article discussed in length um, how he had turned to either selling his property or hauling water. And I felt, I felt quite sad for this, this gentleman whose um, well had gone dry because the water levels in the area um, were dropping beyond what his well could pull up. So he was kind of in a bind. Um, and I was also thinking to myself, um, it was too bad that the author didn't, uh, the journalist didn't consider also lar large rain harvesting as a um, overall solution to supplying water to his home or an addition to um, and other ways of getting water there. So I actually called the journalist and mentioned it to him, um, but that uh, is why I got inspired to do these two publications um, that are available now. And um, one is how to, how to consider taking on uh, large scale rain harvesting and the, the different factors that are involved. And the other one is how to treat large, uh, I'm sorry, how to treat rainwater for um, up to drinking water standards for potable use. Um, so these are two things that are available now. Um, again, I think that um, the need for people to have alternatives is, is extremely important right now because we are actually in a hot spot regarding groundwater um, level changes in the state. And so um, there is worry um, that people will um, lose access to the water table because of the groundwater dropping below what they can, what their well can handle. Um, this is some of the wells that have gone dry. Uh, this is um, pretty old data, but um, there are, um, yeah, concerns. And here's another, uh, what is called an index well, which are um, available for anyone to look at at the ATWR website, the Arizona Department of Water Resources, uh, that are there to monitor uh, water in the, in the aquifer. And so this one you can see is plunging. Uh, good, good reasons to go with large scale rain harvesting. So um, as I'm, I just previously mentioned, uh, you may have a well that is dried up because the water table is dropped below the depth of your well. You may have a low yield well or a seasonally dry well and need more water. Uh, you are unable or unwilling to drill a new well or deepen a well. You wish to avoid trucking in water. Um, you worry about your well water, the quality of your water and rainwater does have fewer contaminants in general. I'll talk more about that later. And you prefer rainwater for its taste, softness, or other desirable qualities. And I'm just gonna stop for a second there and mention that plants do as well. So they like the um, lack of uh, minerals in water um, because that can sometimes inhibit the uptake uh, in roots if the water has too many minerals in it. And rainwater also tends to have a little bit if it's unfiltered um, of maybe some organic matter. Um, and so that's also good for the, for the plants to have a little fertilizer in there. Um, so it, it works for both. Um, regarding how to choose um, whether this might be something to pursue. Um, so when I say that I'm speaking of supplying all of your water needs, with rain or supplementing what you have now with rain water by harvesting it. So um, these are the four things you need to think about. One is your roof size. So that's your catchment area, uh, which we talked about. You can calculate your yield uh, depending on, your, on what your rainfall is. So we, we discussed calculating it for an inch and then you can multiply that by what you get a year kind of imagine how much you can, your, your capacity, your potential to harvest. 
And then you can estimate what kind of storage you would need to harvest what you think is an adequate amount. Um, and then that adequate amount would be determined by your demand inside the house and out. Um, so those four things kind of toggle together to determine if you could take this on based on your roof size, um, the affordability of, of purchasing cisterns, um, what kind of rain you have in your area, and how much water you generally use. Because we, we tend to use different amounts and um, that would be something you would have to have some sense of um, how much you use. So we, we, we can imagine a, a certain part of our roof being used um, if it wasn't big enough to deal, to de, um, sorry, to um, provide a decent yield, you could add other roof surfaces, you could add a garage, you can add a shed, um, and you can also add these, what, what they call rain roofs, which are basically built just to harvest rain. And some double is with other things like this one, it's got equipment under it. So that's a pretty uh, inexpensive way to add um, collection surface especially if you have the space. And you can add tanks, of course. Um, you do not wanna add tanks that go beyond your capacity. So if you don't have enough roof area, having a bigger tank is not gonna do a lot of good. Um, so here's, here's a variety of tanks. Um, there's another underground one up at the left and I'll talk more about some of these later. And rainfall, um, this is also in the publication um, the, that I mentioned, choosing uh, larger scale rain harvesting. So you can get an idea of different rainfalls in different areas. The right column is totals. So if we look real quick at, um, uh, Let's look at tombstones. The purported to get 14 inches a year as an average. Now that's something we will also deal with a little bit later, which is what's happening to our rainfall. Okay. And how do we go forward um, with a new normal? How do we go forward with um, the drought? And um, it can be daunting to consider harvesting rain when we really did not have a monsoon here last year. Um, but it Droughts happen and they end, and um, we're hoping that this happens soon or that we can skirt by with um, some monsoon and a winter rain. Um, so, coagulating demand, um, these are sort of the in indoor uses, and I, I make some suggestions here um, of things you could do to save water and get your GPCD, your your um, gallons per capita per day, your gallons per person per day, which is kind of the standard way of looking at water use down. Um, could be a composting toilet. You could, you know, not flush every time. Um, and, and, and several of these um, methods and get it down to a, a, a reasonable demand. So you don't have to be, you know, building a giant rain roof to get some rain into that tank, and there's a, a limit. Okay, um, and also if you're thinking about just um, harvesting rain for, for plants, um, you can do calculations on that too. We actually have one of these calculators. If anyone wants to write me and ask me, um, what do you think this tree would use and, and so forth, and they're based on um, local evapotranspiration rates. So this nice veggie garden is gonna need around 3000 gallons. So you would, you would calculate, could I, could I harvest that rain with my setup or could I enhance uh, my use of well water or city water with my rain setup? So um, I'm gonna go through some of this, the um, examples I used in uh, this publication. And this one's no Williams and they have extremely deep um, groundwater. So it's prohibitive to dig a well that deep, uh, highly prohibitive. It's quite expensive to go even be four or 500 feet. It's gonna cost you a pretty penny. Um, so he said he put in quite a bit of, of um, capacity here. And now on the left is a, 
settling tank. So it's a, actually a sort of a, a good way to filter um, before it goes into his um, treatment system. Really cool setup. And um, on the little cards suggesting kind of the capacity of things. So he has a 3000 square foot roof. That's quite a bit of area. Um, the potential if he captures all the rain is quite large um, and he has quite a bit of storage. So this is a really, really cool system. Unfortunately, um, it got so dry up there this year that he had to haul in water. So this uh, rain system will double as a way to, to um, hold hauled in water until the rains come back. Um, this is another home in Flagstaff. She's actually um, not in delivery area, although she's in the city of Flagstaff. It's a really beautiful setup that, that they have here. And this is um, up near St. David. This was his original group of tanks and they were living off this water um, from a tiny house and a rain roof. This is the upgrade, um, a significantly larger roof area. It's a really large roof and he has this beautiful round, you see the round tank, which is a modular above ground tank that um, are quite, they've been really discounted from what they used to be. So it's, it's quite a cool alternative. Um, and it's got a pump house there and there's the filtration. So that's Derek. He has um, Handy Man is his YouTube handle. Awesome system. This is um, up in near the Tucson Mountains. This is Jay. And they built this system 20 years ago. They actually were able to get the bank to loan them some money for their, for their system. Um, their groundwater is horrible. So they could not even consider using it. So they bought the property knowing they would have to um, harvest rain. And they're biologists. So you can imagine how intense this treatment system is, um, which goes along with our guidelines as well. Um, yeah, it's probably, uh, I've, I've been talking to some people in Coconino County who they're estimating um, a rain harvesting system to be between 10 and $30,000 for a reasonable su a supply of water. But I know you'll see another example of people who've done it for quite a bit less. This is still Jay's up in near Tucson. That's an underground tank. It's kind of like a swimming pool. It's really not very different from a swimming pool. They actually have a swimming pool. So uh, that adds to their water demand. Um, I talked to Jay recently regarding the drought and he told me that they uh, still have 11,000 gallons in their cistern. Um, they use an average between 54 to 140 gallons a day. Uh, depending on the pool and the evaporation off of the pool. Um, I guess that cuts down on AC if they're swimming a lot. Um, so that's 45 gallons per person per day, which is a decent goal. Um, you can check your water bill if you have pumped in, if you have city water and see how you're doing. Um, so yes, it's good to have enough water in your tank to cover a dry period. The other tip I have for setting up one of these large systems is to uh, not start until you have a sufficient harvest so that you get ahead of the game. Um, so that's their beautiful system. This is a homemade um, ferro cement tank with a Gabion support system on the outside, 13,000 gallons um, with a poly liner inside. So this is, it's not, it's not done here, but it, it did get finished. And these guys um, have quite a low rain, uh, water demand. They're at 22 GPCD gallons per person per day. Um, they have the, an extra rain roof. They have a large porch. So this is a 14,000 gallon tank. So you see we're talking large. Uh, these folks um, accumulated tanks over time. Um, they are still doing well. They have plenty of water for ongoing. I spoke to Bob recently, so that's good news. Um, they are, are quite frugal with water. So they have a lot of different tanks that they've assembled. This is their solar. And there is their one of their tanks. Um, 
these guys and some of these other folk were on our uh, off the grid tour, which we have. And hopefully we'll get that up again, hopefully in the fall. So be on the lookout for, our, for the really fun off the grid tour and a rain harvesting tour. So you see they have a lot of different tanks here. There's one, you can see a variety of the storage volumes and there is their overflow and there is their first flush. A little hard to see, but it's there on the right. The water goes, the dirty water from the first flush of the first rain of the season goes in there. The first uh, flush of any rain and that's the dirtiest water and it helps keep the rest of the water in the tank clean. So uh, in addition to um, some of the things we've been looking at, I have a comparison of the different alternatives for water supply um, in areas that are concerned with uh, dropping groundwater levels. And they actually came out pretty similar, um, uh, really around the like 27,000 range, um, depending on the depth. So 350 might, might not work to get to where you feel like it's a safe level. Uh, you wouldn't wanna drill or deepen and then have to do it again. So um, this is a $28,000 gallon um, modular tank. They actually go up in like a morning and they, um, they're pretty cool. They're uh, not as expensive as you think. I think that one is 13,000, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then you've got all the piping and pumping, and, you know, the filtration. Um, if you have groundwater from a well, you might be using some treatment with that too. Um, it's important to test that once a year. Uh, once you have an initial test, you know what's going on um, for E. coli at the minimum. Um, but rain is also, uh, it's very necessary to treat rain. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm just gonna cover some drought considerations. Um, so being in a mega drought, uh, we, we wanna think about a plan B, a backup source. So you have a primary source and then you can have a secondary source. You can truck in water if your rain is getting low into the same tanks. You, maybe you're trucking in water now and you're gonna build up a rain harvesting system gradually over time as you can afford gutters and so forth in the cisterns. Um, you may have a well performing well and quite a few people have enhanced their well performing well by storing that water when it's performing better and also having harvested rainwater. Um, sometimes they're in two different sources into the house and that can be difficult. Um, it's best to be able to combine them before it goes into the treatment and into the home. And then the other way around, you could have a harvesting rainwater and then know that your well isn't performing well, but that you'll get something out of it. Getting it clean. So um, there is, there is a, a, some, time, some misconceptions about rainwater and how, how clean it is. And um, in general, I say it's very, very high quality water. And that also depends though on your location. So we're lucky that this area is in a place that's relatively free from um, industry. There is agriculture, which can um, make some dust and uh, pesticides airborne. Um, but in general, we're pretty, we're in a good location. There's not a lot of urban um, heavy metals coming from urban industry or hydrocarbons and from uh, pollution from heavy traffic. So it's, that's, that's good, that's good news. Um, so it's, it's, it's really great water. Um, it's also, it's a little softer. People rave about their hair um, and their um, clothes and their sinks being all shiny. So it's great water. Um, it's also hungry, so it does absorb things. Um, if it's in a cement tank, you have to add some slate to change the pH. Um, and it can pick things up from the air and it can um, pick things up from the surface on which it's being captured from. So uh, those are considerations. Uh, these are the publications that handle, uh, the one on the right is preparing rainwater for potable use, which I co-wrote with a, a wonderful um, chemist um, and extension uh, associate, Dr. Artiola, who's been down here many times, many of you might know him, discussing well water and he's written publications about wells. And we have publications about wells that um, are free. Please let me know if you want one. 
So again, you know, the difference between uh, rainwater and groundwater, there are um, some problems uh, common to groundwater in Arizona. Um, we all know the high mineral content, so we see the, the white calcium deposits and so forth, um, often if we're on our sinks and, and stuff. Um, there's also some, can be heavy metals um, and other contaminants. It's important to keep a septic um, pumped out so you're not overflowing uh, raw sewage into the environment, your downstream neighbor. Um, and then there's other activities that can cause uh, contamination of groundwater. So I just want a little plug in here for something we did earlier this year. The Arizona Department of Health conducts um, free water testing for heavy metals. Look on the WaterWise website. Um, and if you want to be on that mailing list, you can put your email in the chat or just your name. We actually have your emails from the registration. Um, so it's a great opportunity to get your well water tested for heavy metals. It doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen if you're interested, let me know. So um, again, I don't wanna to get too technical, but um, to create your own treatment system uh, on your property, you have these components and the pre-filtration happens with screens that go into, there's a screen, you're screening um, debris while you go into the tank um, and other ways to pre-filter. There's a pump, pressure tank, or a booster pump, which doesn't have a pressure tank. It's more expensive, but very efficient. And then we suggest the three-prong method, um, which is sediment filters of different fineness, um, activated carbon, and is one of them. And then ultraviolet radiations for all the little um, squigglies and um, giardias and so forth, these um, living things that um, you don't want to be imbibing. Um, and there's alternatives um, that I give in the publication also. This is a ceramic filter. Um, it also is um, very efficient at getting out viruses and bacteria and other microbes. And then people who really have concerns, they've had their rain tested even, will realize that they, they may have some fixture somewhere that's contributing. Maybe they have old lead flashings on their roof. So they will uh, resort to another form of treatment after the three prong, which is um, reverse osmosis. So yeah, here's some of the, there's the first flush. Um, large pipes are good, uh, keep the water flowing. There's a nice tank with a very fine lid that uh, my colleague um, Rick Weisberg is installing in a tank. And there's a, a great big uh, modular tank down there. There's other ways to make sure you're getting the best water out of the tank. Here is some treatment, the three-prong method. Um, so it's, it's a U of A validated method for definitely creating uh, safe drinking water from rain. Now here's another version. This one, the variation, um, they used 10 micron. We mentioned five and um, slightly larger cord activating carbon filtration. Beautiful setup though. And then a cheaper additional options, there's um, ceramic filters, there's a candle filtration, and this is a setup for a earth ship that has a candle filtration and some other spin down filters. So there's different ways to do these things at different price ranges. Um, again, we talked some about drought. So um, we will see what happens with our, our precipitation. Um, drought is common to this area with the uh, rising temperatures. We, we get less out of our water due to evaporation. So it's really actually great to harvest that water and keep it from evaporating. Um, and then there's the price issues. Um, so hopefully those will be lowering considerably. And in terms of the sort of comparison between wells and um, rain harvesting large, on a large scale, um, 
the maintenance is more intense for rain harvesting, just that you're, you really need to be on top of your system. Not that you wouldn't want to watch your well water either and treat it for things that it needs to be treated for, but you do have to be there. You can't be um, leaving it alone for too long. So there's some maintenance involved um, in your home treatment system. And um, the other issue is that um, the maintenance is, is a little more intense, but also the uh, um, repairs and so forth are, are much more expensive for a well, deepening a well, replacing a well pump, um, for instance, those two things are much more expensive than the components of a rain harvesting system. So that's, that's good news for rain harvesters. All right, so we'll end um, with a little, almost end with a little quiz, um, which, which gets the best score for rain harvesting activity. So is it Hawaii, Texas, US Virgin Islands, or Arizona? Here we go. So the US Virgin Islands does a lot of it. Hawaii does a lot. It, they use often the swimming pools, above ground swimming pools. They have a lot of rain and maybe off the grid. Texas doing very well. They've really had to come to terms with a lot of drought there. So they've upped their game. And Arizona is fourth in the country, which is really awesome. All right. Um, I think we have one more poll, perhaps, perhaps not. If not, that is what I have. Um, so uh, we'll open up for questions. It looks like, let's see, in the chat, um, there was some sharing of resources. Um, Christine Brown says that she loves the rain roof. She saw in St. David on the off-grid tour. It's awesome. Um, there's a resource about groundwater in Arizona and Cochise County. Uh, but one that's actual question, Christine or Christy Brown is asking if there, she says that she's seen uh, many collapsible tanks for sale. Have you heard anything about them since we have long dry spells? Great. Uh, no, <sighs> right. not. I've heard of them. I am not that familiar with them, but I will definitely look into them. I, 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 I had kind of in mind like the driveway, you know, something you could put up real fast if you have a driveway and then it has an out, an outflow into a tank that has to have some, there has to be some gravity. So it has to be on a slope or it has to be higher than the storage. But what do you know about that, Christy? Can you unmute her? Yeah, I got it now. Oh, hey. Um, I just, when I search for rain tanks now, I see them popping up more and more. A hundred, couple hundred gallons. The cost is so much less. And then I think about, well, we can go easily three or four months without. So you could just collapse it and put it away. And when, you know, usually we know when the rain's coming. So and then put them up. It would seem to encourage you to use up your rainwater and not let it sit, you know. I have to remind myself to go clean my smaller tanks, go out there and flush them. And so uh, something maybe for the future because it, if you're not a really careful shopper and not, you know, shopping online, you can really pay about a dollar a gallon to, to collect, I think Marianne is a reasonable rate, so. I think, it, yeah, it depends. I mean, as you get larger, it tends to get cheaper, maybe down to about 60 cents a gallon, but um, yeah. yeah, no, that's a very interesting idea. Um, I don't know their quality because I haven't explored them at this point, but um, yeah, it keeps people more involved. Sometimes things get set up and then people don't use them. You know, that's kind of common. Um, they just get forgotten. So that's a good remedy for that, um, yeah. But rainwater does keep very well. So I don't think there's um, a lot of concern about that as long as it's light tight. Unless, <sighs> you know, things, systems fail. So there's always, there's always a possibility that something could fall off and a rat could go in your tank and die or something, you know. So yeah, keeping on top of it seems like it could benefit. Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it sounds like you kind of addressed Teresa, De Teresa Gallego's question, but she says, I was late to the presentation. Did you address water storage times? For example, can I store August rainfall for say a year? Is it still potable? Just sounds like as long as it's stored properly, it is. Okay, I'm really glad you asked that question because I, I don't think I emphasize quite enough that rain has to be treated to be potable. Okay, so we don't drink um, straight up rainwater. So rain has to be treated because from what it's captured off of, there can be um, animal things, uh, urine and so forth. Um, there can be dust, there can be um, contaminants even potentially. So we have to treat it, but yes, it lasts quite long and then you can treat it as you use it. So yes, it lasts. I, I, think, I think you might've missed a picture I showed of, of a five-year-old um, batch of water, which was like perfectly clear. So, and uh, she filters. followed up. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just reading what you're reading. Okay. Berkey filters. I use a Berkey. Um, there's not a lot of research on the Berkey. Uh, I have to say that most of how I came to it was anecdotal. Um, but I've I've been very happy with it, and it is. Um, purported to be very good for taking up viruses and bacteria and, and other contaminants that like chlorine that we might get from tap water or other kinds of water. So I have to say yes to the work we And then Jennifer yeah, there, has, oh, sorry. Oh, I was gonna say that the question about modular tanks, I'm interested in that too. Okay. Where a company well, to get modular tanks. I don't have a company for that, but I can let you guys both know. Cause that you, you're talking about the ones that are the like modular containers underground with the poly liner. I was thinking the steel tanks, the round ones. And oh, you the, get the, well, the above ground ones. The pieces, the pieces that you put up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know what she was thinking. Let me, let yeah, me see I if I can find one. that real quick. Well, that's that, you know, wanted. that's actually in the, um, the publication. Did you guys get the link to that, because um, I have a lot of resources on those publications of places to buy things. Um, okay. That's on there. I can't. I can't look now because I. I can't. Um, is it the because, which one is it? Is it the oh choosing large scale rain harvesting for potable supply? That one. Yeah. Okay. Then I will. Let me look in there real quick. Actually, I have a copy right here. I will re. Because there's one that that will bring it. it. Um, you know, they come to your house, they come from Australia, so they do have to be shipped over, but then they bring them to your house with a crew and they put them up in a, in a matter of, a, of, of less than a day. So, um, so. Rebecca, do you have your hand raised? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a middle school science teacher at Wilcox. And uh, I have been inviting WaterWise to my classes to talk to my students for the past two, three years. I'm not sure. I'm really grateful for that. But we just do this like once in a while. So I was thinking if as a school, if we want to install something like this, what, what do we need to do? Well, do Tombstone High School just installed a tank. Yeah. And so is there a place we can apply for a grant or do something? Is. There is, you should have Yeah, if it's a school, um, we have grants that run up to $2,000. But will 2,000 be enough to install a rain harvesting system? Well, it won't be the whole system, but it'll be a, a nice chunk for the tank. I'm hoping to uh, start a greenhouse at the middle school this year, also applying for a grant for it. So I would like to uh, like join these two projects together and even if this rain harvesting system can provide water, at least to the greenhouse, that would be great. That would be really good. So yeah, we also right. have a community probably get garden attachment from person. Go ahead. I was just saying it would probably be good to have the catchment from the, um, the greenhouse as well. Mm -hmm. She didn't need me to tell you that. That'd be really cool. I'm gonna put this number in here for aquamate tanks. These are the large above ground modular tanks. 
And is there a way that all these links that are in the chat that could be emailed to us or something? Because I'm, right now I'm trying to copy paste each of them and I don't know how efficient I am. That's, that's good. I think I, I think. Um, if, you, if you'd like to, well, you can private message me your email and I can, I can send them links in email if you'd like, Rebecca. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Sure. If, if, if others want those, let I, me let us know. Right. And can, th this is recorded, so we can get it. Will we be able to see the chat when we go in? No. Okay. It's yeah, it's mm -hmm. recorded and sent to us in a in a little file. But um, I Does guess if anybody anyone... want it, I mean, we can just we can send it. We can send it out to everybody because we'll be emailing you with the survey in case you didn't get a chance to do that tonight. Yeah, so. I think we all want it. And then Rebecca, there might be some other places you could get um, get grants too, the Legacy Foundation and the and maybe maybe our Rotary Club, Rebecca. Right. <laughs> maybe, maybe help yes. a little. Yes, I was just thinking like we talk a lot about these environmental things. A school will be a best place to start introducing all these changes, so we can reach a larger population. For anyone who has a rotary, yeah, for anyone who has a rotary club in their community, um, I noticed in our magazine that we are now one of our focus areas is the environment. So that might be something that you could easily fit in. So Karen brought up a good point that if you um, if you click on the three dots at the bottom of your of your chat where it says more, you have the option to save the chat. Um, I'm not really sure where it saves it to, but can try if I guess I could save it and find out where it gets saved to. Show in folder. Um, it is saved in a Zoom file. Just creates its own file, I guess. But I could also email it. That might be a little more um, easy to look at. Um, Jennifer had the question, is farming, namely pecan farms and dairy, the main reason for the drop in groundwater? Um, well, you know, we live in, a, in an area that's a rural part of the country, so the groundwater use is not monitored. So we don't really know how much is being used by whom, unlike other areas of the state that have some management happening for their groundwater. Um, considering the number of wells, uh, if you want to look at a well map on the Arizona Department of Water Resources and um, look at the match them up with their locations, you probably you probably see a great deal of wells on um, agri large agricultural interests. So uh, I would have to say yes to that question. It just would have to be the case if there's that many wells um, on agricultural properties that are pumping. Um, but I don't have data for that. So I am drawing that inference myself. And who, may I, may I ask, who is um, responsible for starting monitoring? I live in McNeil and there's pecan after pecan orchard going up out here. They're clearing land weekly and putting in new orchards. The, the state um, the House of Representatives and Senate, the state legislature, they are in charge of whether agriculture land would be um, monitored or regulated or anything. Anything agriculture is outside of a regulation for, for anybody. Um, and, and you should contact the legislators. You actually live in a, an irrigation non-expansion area, which it hasn't made a lot of difference there because whenever it was going in, everybody put well more wells in immediately before it took effect. So they're still losing water at about the same groundwater about the same rate as the Wilcox area, and we don't have an irrigation non-expansion area. There, there's a lot to say about groundwater. I've been working with it for a couple of years now, um, but I I think our only hope in the future, and, and people are going to tell you that. Um, the only hope really is to get the state legislature to say it's okay to um, to put some put the brakes on just a little bit if if that's all they did. Um, we're working on doing some recharge wells and things up here, but that's not going to help you there in your area. And 
it does look like it's growing the down there in Alfreda too. It's it's really crazy the number of trees that are going in. And trees wow. are different. They don't take much water when they're little and then they grow and they take more and more and more and more water as they grow, obviously. Um, it's a, a really different type of an industry. It's not like growing a garden or crop, so. Rebecca, do you have a question or something you wanted to say? Me or the other Rebecca? I mean, okay. The interesting thing oh, about groundwater is that it's, it's what's called a common pool resource. So it is shared. You don't have fences underground, you know, to keep the water from moving around the uh, aquifer, especially on this kind of a basin. But we're not really um, regulating how we share that water in these rural areas, unlike Tucson, Phoenix, um, uh, Prescott and more recently the Santa Cruz has a what they call active management area so there's there's ways there's plans to work towards conservation of the aquifers in those areas um, so yeah it's a it's an interesting conundrum that we have a, a, a very shared resource but there's not a lot of, of mechanisms for guaranteeing that everybody has um, access to it without the burden falling on people with less financial resources. Does that answer anyone's question? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a hard question to answer. As Peggy said, yeah, there's, there's, there's been a lot of discussion and hopefully there'll be, continue to be a lot of discussion about um, the future of our aquifers, aquifer here and it's plummeting level. There's a, a brand new um, updated study at Arizona Department of um, Quality, I'm mean, not quality, ADWR um, on their website and it's under programs and you can see the Wilcox aquifer. That's not gonna really go to your aquifer, Jennifer, cause you're just a little bit, you're south of us obviously. But that if anybody's interested in the Wilcox one, they've actually updated the study they did in 2018. It's a long book, but it's very interesting. And it shows everything she's talking about. If you're asking about how agriculture affects, you can see how agri agriculture has affected it because they've done a real intensive study on the Wilcox Basin. Um, and that's what I said, it's under programs and then you have to go to the, the studies or whatever under programs. Um, and Rebecca Boshme, you have your hand up. That's why we're asking you. Uh, <laughs> I didn't put my hand down, my bad. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that okay. was left over. So, from yeah, I, I do. A couple of years ago, maybe in, in 2019, we had a tree plantation drive in Wilcox, planting drive uh, with the school kids, and we raised funds and we planted trees around the golf course and the cemetery. But I was hoping to do this program with every year that passes through my classes. But unfortunately, I was told I can't because we don't have enough water. So, the city can't supply water. So are there any trees that do not require too much water at local and that we can still continue this program of planting? What did you plant? You can we plant planted Af yeah. Afghan pines. And I know they, they need a lot of water. And so the city provided us the place where we, they had irrigation set up already. What kind of plants did you? Afghan pines. Oh, lovely. Um, well, any tree in, is going to take three years to establish. So you're always going to have some water use up front, no matter what it kind it is. I um, mean, I guess your objective is shade or just like beautification. Beautification, shade, just adding more greenery. Nice. Yeah. Well, as I, as I mentioned, I do have a water demand calculator. If you wanted me to run some numbers on us on species, I mean, a desert willow is really low water. Um, desert, um, the hackberry, I love that tree. That's quite low water. Um, there's a lot of them in mesquite, of course. Mesquite, um, acacia, there, yeah. there are a yeah, ton of resources. So they, any tree is going to take a little bit initially, but then just to get established. So mesquites are native here and have a very deep root. So they wouldn't need a lot of constant watering. But you do have to, to water to establish. There's no point in buying a beautiful plant and then having it not make it through those first three years. And also with 
some of the extra temperatures that we have now, um, I do think we're going to have to think about giving those some of those native trees even a boost of water, perhaps once in the dry season or twice. Um, that's 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 a reality. Well, we will send you the chat. We will send you a link to the video. We will send you a survey. And um, yes, let me go ahead and put the the survey in the chat right now while we're talking about it, so that we communicate that we really do want you to fill out the survey, please. <laughs> and um, if gotta... no one has any other questions or comments, well, th I just want to say thank you, everyone, for attending, and and I'm the one that's from Wilcox Growing Healthy Wilcox including Rebecca, you're on our email list. You know you're part of us, right? Okay, she knows. All right, and anyone on here who would like to contact me about water issues, I'm I'm not an expert, but I've grown up here and grew up on a farm and I understand agriculture and what's going on. And I did um, facilitate a, a water, Wilcox, Wilcox Water Project. And we have a website, Wilcox Water Project, and it includes newspaper articles and the links to those uh, studies at ADWR it has quite a lot of things and it has videos of the programs that we produced, including a program similar to what we saw today by Marianne. So um, they are on that website, wilcoxwaterproject.org. So, and anyone can call me. I'm, I'm first, those of you who might not know, I'm the county supervisor, Jennifer Christie. Um, you can find my name, my number at the county, easy. So, Peggy Judd. Thanks, and yeah. and I do, I do appreciate you joining in today. And there'll be there'll be other groups that you can investigate on Facebook. Um, keep in touch, and we'll let you know what we learn. Um, and if you'd like to be on our mailing list, please put your put that in the chat before we go. Thank you, Peggy, for for making this happen too. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, with that, I guess we will say adieu. Nice to have everyone. And anytime you wanna contact me, feel, please feel free, please feel free. Right here, I'll, I'll share the, the final slide. It has Marianne's email and stuff on it and I can also put it in the, in the chat. <laughs> A couple mailing list people. All right. Go team. All right, everybody. <laughs> Have a wonderful night and thanks for coming. We'll see you next Thank time. You. Uh